Please subscribe, like and share our videos. Exclusive content brought to you here on Latif Yahya's channel only. Latif Yahya has asserted his rights under the Copyright, Designs, and Patents Act, 1988 to be identified as the author of this work. This book is sold subject to the condition that it shall not, by way of trade or otherwise, be left, resold, hired out, or otherwise circulated without the author's prior consent in any form of binding or cover other than that in which it is published and without a similar condition including this condition being imposed on the subsequent purchaser. Chapter 6 My Debut I'm relaxing on the huge bed in Uday's bedroom, or my bedroom now, in project number 7, breathing in the autumn air. It's October and Baghdad is much cooler than it has been during the summer months. Following my meeting with Saddam, my training has double clutched up a gear. I'm forever being criticized and taken to the video room to see more footage of Uday's public appearances and I now feel I know all his mannerisms off by heart. But copying them exactly is far from easy as I've been trained as a soldier not an actor. The routine hardly changes. Two days of watching tapes then two days of parrot practice. Copying his tone of voice, his movements and even the words he uses. Munyam Hamd is virtually the only person I talk to. He's my mentor and is patient with me even though I know he is that human bulldog Syed Hassan Hashim al Nasiri, a mass murderer and Saddam's chief executioner breathing down his neck. The bulldog growls us onward and I notice that even Uday is wary of him as he has a direct line to the president. One day we practice the role Uday has as president of the sports club, the next I'm the president's son inspecting a guard of honor. Munyam Ham shows me how to salute as sloppily as Uday does and to ensure that my wardrobe is far from sloppy. Uday always dresses smarter than a pristine mannequin in a designer shop window in a prestigious western shopping street. One important telltale trait was to master Uday's routine with sunglasses. He slowly takes the gold-rimmed Ray-Bans out of their case, nonchalantly flips them open, positions them firmly on his nose and then peers through them, staring past people with his nose in the air. My eyes slowly become used to wearing the sunglasses and, like Uday, I wear them all the time even in dark rooms, I often wish I'd had a pair when I was thrown into the red cell. The sunglasses spare me the trouble of wearing eye makeup to disguise the fact that my eyes are marginally smaller than Uday's. During all the weeks of intensive training, I never have a minute to be myself, to be Latif Yahya. Even when I'm in my golden prison, project number 7, I have to continually play the role. Even the staff treat me exactly the same way they do the president's son without commenting on the fact that there are suddenly now two of us. I learn any lapses are threatened with punishment from the bulldog and everyone knows what that means. So they all stick rigidly to the rules of this absurd game. Only in one way has my life changed since my visit to Saddam's office. Before it, Uday had hardly stayed at project number 7 at all. Now, he seems to be here all the time. He personally oversees all my training and doesn't just confine himself to watching the videos they make of me and comparing them to the originals of himself. No, he's with me all the time. He's become my shadow, always in the background, watching, criticizing but makes absolutely no effort to chat to me or become friends. In fact, the reverse is the case. The longer my training goes on, the more impatient he becomes and has frequent outbursts of rage at the smallest error I make. It's not that I'm not trying my best. I'm making every effort and am entirely committed to being his mirror image but it's all very off-putting. He ignores me more and more as if I am his worst enemy in the world. So much for being his brother, I think to myself. In early November 1987, Saddam appoints his son to be president of the Iraqi Olympic Committee. I haven't a clue whether an Iraqi sportsman has ever won an Olympic medal or even come close to winning one. I suspect the chairman's job is just a bribe to Uday to keep him busy and stop him interfering elsewhere. Of course, I'm also appointed to the new job and am no longer just the body double for the head of the national sports associations but also a fide for the chairman of the Iraqi Olympic Committee. It means I'll have to meet and greet more international guests as Uday Saddam Hussein. 
Uday is officially notified of his new role on a Tuesday morning and his appointment features on Iraqi television the same day, the main item on the official news channel. All the Iraqi newspapers also carry long reports on the subject. Even the only newspaper printed in English, the Baghdad Observer, considers my boss's appointment merits a long, front-page article. The following day, we're sitting in the video wall theater and Munyam Hamd is co-acting out a new scenario with me. I'm the chairman of the Iraqi Olympic Committee welcoming an Olympic delegation at the airport. Surely no foreign athlete is going to assassinate Uday, I think. I assume he's obviously so unenthusiastic about his new position that he can't be bothered to appear in person. But he has appeared in person to watch us. He's in the video wall theater for the first time, slumped in the back row, scrutinizing everything. I'm standing in front of a podium with microphones, my bodyguards alongside me all wearing sunglasses. There's a red carpet and flower arrangements as props. Overnight, the room has been dressed as a set to match the reception area in Saddam Hussein's private airport. We'd visited the airport that very morning so it was fresh in my memory. It's about seven miles from the palace and has two runways so long that even jumbo jets can land on them. The palace and airport are connected by a smooth, well-built road that's continually patrolled by police. They're really secret service officers who only wear police uniforms as a disguise and only work four-hour shifts. In Baghdad, these officers who stand like human trees along the side of the road are called bomber. As Saddam Hussein seldom leaves Iraq, it seems a waste of manpower but there's an ulterior reason for their presence. Saddam Hussein travels the road every day to reach another of his residences, his castle in al Amriya. This is situated to the west of the airport and halfway along the airport road, there's a turning off to this private home which Saddam calls Muyama al rayasi the headquarters. Even school children are taught never to use this road. It's strictly off-limit to ordinary mortals and the punishment for flouting this law is severe. Anyone who either deliberately or accidentally turns onto it is arrested and locked up. Possibly even executed as the officers guarding it are all-powerful and like to remind Baghdadis of this by regularly making an example of someone. The airport building isn't very large as airport buildings go. It's more like a wing of a medium-sized international business. But there is a large car park in front to allow the multi-vehicle presidential convoy to pull up. The airport's main room is a spacious reception lounge with chairs set out in squares which are separated by potted plants. A huge portrait of Saddam Hussein dominates the room and oversees the comings and goings. Underneath the painting is an Iraqi eagle and the red, white and black Iraqi flag with the three green stars. Directly below this patriotic decor is a stage on which stands a podium and microphone. There are thick carpets your feet sink into. On state visits, this is where the visiting dignitaries are welcomed by their Iraqi hosts and the first public addresses are made and polite small talk exchanged. In the hangars with hydraulically operated gates, two Boeing long-haul jets, five helicopters and two MiG fighters are on standby. They always have full tanks of fuel and are ready for immediate takeoff. Pilots and aircrews are ready to transport the president wherever he wants to go at any time day or night. One of the pilots, Captain Mazar al Tikriti is a friend of mine. He's a helicopter pilot and usually has the honor of flying the president. Saddam affectionately calls his air crews the eagles of the Iraqi airspace. I have a good look round the airport and try to guess how Uday would greet foreign delegations. Back in the video wall room, I stand on the red carpet by the podium. Munyam Hamd gives the instruction, the delegation has just landed. You will cordially welcome them and walk with them past the guard of honor immediately afterwards. I walk up to the imaginary leader of the delegation and shake his hand. I find it difficult to keep a straight face as this whole farcical situation suddenly strikes me as rather funny. Here I am in a mock airport inspecting an imaginary delegation. I can't take it as seriously as I know I should. I feel as if I'm in a comic strip and burst out laughing. I immediately recover my poise and apologize but it's too late. Uday leaps to his feet and charges up to me. His right hand grips the electric cable. His face is furious. I can't see his eyes as they're hidden behind his Ray-Bans. He yells at me to turn around. I obey and wince as I know what's going to happen. Uday starts beating me with the electric cable like he's a man possessed. 
he goes berserk and whips the cable into my back again and again. It's as if he's having a fit, he groans, forcing his breath out through his nostrils with every blow. None of the officers dares to say anything or hold him back. I feel a terrible stinging pain but I take my punishment or education without crying out or asking him to stop. The humiliation of being thrashed in front of Munyam Hamd and all the officers is worse than the physical pain. Uday had hardly any reason to start whipping me. What had I done? I just laughed during my training. That minor indiscretion was enough to make him lose his temper. I count the blows. I get to 33 before he stops. Not through pity for me but through sheer exhaustion. He's panting, his hairline glistening with perspiration. Then he suddenly laughs hysterically, that staccato, he he hey hey. He seems satisfied, liberated of a demon or as if his violent outburst has given him some kind of sexual satisfaction. I wonder if Uday is a sadist and can only get rid of his sexual and intellectual frustrations by a show of bestial violence? I know some flawed, warped personalities hate without reason. They have a tendency towards aggression which they direct on defenseless objects or people to work them off. Only immature people are sadists. In his younger days, Saddam Hussein vented his anger on animals with his red-hot iron rod. What gene has Uday inherited from his father? Might he turn out to be even worse than Saddam? His senseless outbreak of violence is nothing but a pitiful excuse to himself, a legitimization, in all probability Uday hates himself. When he has regained his composure he orders, go on, and leaves the room, still breathing heavily. We continue with the run-through as if nothing had happened. All of us concentrating intensely and being painstakingly precise until it is perfected to the smallest detail. Every day until the 27th December, we practice in front of the video wall. Every evening, we watch videos of the day's rehearsals identifying and analyzing mistakes in order to eradicate them the next day. During these weeks, I get to know Uday much better. I study him closely and pay attention to his every word. I try to remember every single aspect of his behavior. Ideally, I'd like to write notes but I don't dare as I worry about repercussions if one of the bodyguards discovered the notes and Uday misinterpreted them and took offense. My training seems never-ending. I'm told we're going to spend the next few weeks training in hand-to-hand -hand combat and shooting. I can't quite work out why but it suits me fine. It's all old hat after my military training and it turns out to be virtually identical with certain additions. They teach me how Uday, who apparently always carried a magnum as a child, draws and uses his pistol. How he cocks a machine gun, often just to intimidate people, and fires into the air or ceiling as an expression of childish delight. I'm also shown how to play with a pistol the way Uday does. Like a gunslinger in a western. Without warning, he has the UN nerving habit of taking his gun out of its holster in the middle of a meeting, plays with it, aims it at the person he's talking to, puts his index finger on the trigger then, laughs. Some joke? Then he takes the pistol in his other hand and spins it like a cowboy in a film. It's an oddball exercise but I have to train to do it. Uday loves playing with his gun in that intimidating way. What kind of sick mind finds it amusing to cock his revolver, aim at someone and acting like he's going to shoot them? By now, I've stopped wondering whether my training is in my best interest or not. I have no choice, anyway. But the longer I spend in the company of the dictator's son, the further detached I get from reality. My entire life with Uday is so over the top and unreal that reflections about deeper issues are quite pointless. He's a maniac who's completely lost his equilibrium. And the system he thrives in is so absurd that his extravagances and quirky behavior are nothing special, they just represent normality. To Uday, I'm a body double, a look-alike, a brother and a subservient object on which he can work off his aggression without fear of reprisal. I'm the one he can educate and mold to his will. Finally, on 29th of February 1988, my training as a fide comes to an end. The next day, 1st of March 1988, Munyam Ham dictates a brief letter to the head of the Secret Service. Iraqi Republic Director of the Chancellery of the Republic Secret Service Organization Secret Persecution Department In the name of God the merciful secret and strictly confidential To the Honorable Director of the Secret Service 
I should like to make your lordship aware that I and my officers who were made responsible for the special training of Lt. Latif Yahi Latif al-Salihi, have concluded this secret training. Lt. Latif Yahya Latif al-Salihi has studied in the use of all kinds of weapons in order to serve as a representative of Mr. Uday Saddam Hussein. He has successfully survived the practice period. Everything else is within your hands, sir. Major Munyam Shabib Hamd al-Tikriti head of the Secret Persecution Department 1st of March 1988. The letter is a pure formality. My training is over and I've been accepted by both Uday and his father. Or at least there hasn't been any further reaction from Saddam's palace which must mean that everything is still all right. Munyam Hamd sends the letter. And I am suddenly sent dozens of uniforms. These include a bodyguard's uniform, a pilot's uniform and a black military uniform with the name Uday sewn into it. I'm also provided with identification papers and false names. Quite apart from being Uday, I'm now Captain Ahib al-Hadizi, a secret service officer with al Qas. Mohammed Sami Ahmed from the Social Affairs Ministry or Mute Bal Kemali, a clerk in the Ministry of the Economy. If anything goes wrong and I'm shot then there'll be no shortage of explanations. The man who was assassinated wouldn't be Uday Saddam Hussein or Latif Yahya, who has officially ceased to exist, but Captain Ahib al-Hadizi of the Secret Service. It's like graduating from university, everyone congratulates me. Even Uday is friendly and drinks a brandy with me. A Hennessy, no ice, served in cut crystal goblets. Nothing further happens for five days. Uday instructs me to relax. No videos, no language exercises, switch off. I don't need telling twice. I lounge around the pool, lay in the sun, allow the staff to wait on me hand and foot. I look through the wardrobes and marvel at the hundreds of suits, the silk underwear, the socks from Paris and all the pairs of handmade shoes from Rome. I doubt many menswear stores carry as much stock. I'm living in a world of extravagant illusion. I feel exclusive. Even the food I'm served is the very best. Every day I tuck into meat, vegetables and fresh salad, all prepared as European dishes as Uday isn't fond of Arab cuisine. My break lasts four relaxing days and during that idyllic time, I try not to think about the future. I don't want to torment myself worrying about what might happen. I accept my fate for what it is and that inner detachment does me good. Constant reflection is pointless as there's nothing I can do to change my situation. On the evening of 4th of March 1988, I have visitors. Uday comes to my room accompanied by the bulldog. I don't even notice them at first as the door is open and I'm laying on the bed watching a video. It's Japanese, full of hand-to-hand combat, samurai demonstrating their swordplay and kung fu fighters. Uday loves these videos and I'm becoming a fan, too. There's no real plot but plenty of action, a bit like my own life at present. The bulldog stays in the doorway but Uday sits on a chair and says in his usual dramatic style, Latif, there's a perfect opportunity. We're going to test you. I sit up, when? The day after tomorrow, in the afternoon at the People's Stadium. I gather there's a football match between two Iraqi teams and over 50,000 spectators are expected. The stadium has a presidential box where members of Saddam's family can watch the match in relative safety but still be seen by the crowd. It's quite detached from the football fans so they would only be able to see me from a distance and probably not notice any mistakes I might make. Latif, it's your first appearance so concentrate on it. Everything that happens on this day will be vital to future events. By that, I take it that if I'm rumbled, I'll be killed. But if everything goes without a hitch, my career as Uday's fide will really take off. My visitors leave after this and I don't see Uday again until the 6th March. Thankfully, I feel confident and just as relaxed as I was when paraded in front of his lordship Saddam Hussein. Yasim al Halu is Uday's personal advisor in matters of clothing and attire and mine now. Out of the hundreds available, he's selected a light-colored suit for me to wear. Yasim has been a member of the clan for years. He originates from a poor district of Baghdad, trained as a tailor and is probably homosexual. I've never seen him with a woman but it's not just that that makes me question his sexual preferences. His movements are graceful and could be described as feminine. His voice is gentle, 
as is his manner, and he always smells of deep, heavy oriental perfume. As I remember from our school days, Uday has never been noted for good taste as far as his clothes are concerned. He used to run around the place like a vulgar little peasant boy, says Yasim, visibly shuddering at the horrific memory. He was always choosing colors that simply didn't match. I find Yasim amusing, especially the way he holds his hand out as if holding something invisible. When he discusses Uday's latest clothing dilemma in his slightly feminine, anguished tone, he totters on mincing little steps to the wardrobes, flings them open, stares in horror at the colorful array of suits and hisses, just what am I supposed to advise the young gentleman to wear this time? Whatever Yasim decides, Uday wears. Everything Uday has acquired in the way of sartorial elegance, he can thank Yasim for. His official dresser accompanies Uday when he flies to London, Paris, Rome or Milan to spend an enjoyable few days clothes shopping. Yasim is always by Uday's side encouraging him to fulfill his every desire. Shoes, underwear, shirts, ties, suits. During the course of a normal day, Uday changes his suit four times. When Uday attends conferences or meetings, Yasim is an essential member of his entourage. I'm happy with the clothing Yasim has selected for me. It's a light-colored suit, striped shirt and a silk burgundy tie. The color combinations work well. As I get dressed, Yasim asks me why Ismail isn't present. Ismail Al-Azami is Uday's personal hairdresser. A factotum like Yasim and cuts Uday's hair every 10 days without fail. In appreciation, Uday has given him three hairdressing salons and sent him plenty of customers. He's considered the hairdresser of the Iraqi capital. It was Ismail who carefully trimmed my hair and beard before I met Saddam. Yasim fusses around me like a fly, brushing my jacket and straightening my tie. For the finishing touch, I put on my ray bands. They're smudged so I clean them with a towel that's lying on the bed. I feel like an actor who's rehearsed ad nauseum for his opening night performance. But I have no stage fright despite the 50,000 strong audience I'm due to make my debut in front of. They'll be gathering in the stadium right now. I only feel slightly tense when Azam and the other bodyguards come to collect me. This time, our convoy consists of more than 10 cars and, just as Uday would do, I'm driving my Mercedes. We hurtle through Baghdad towards the stadium. It's on Palestine Street, one of the capital's lush, green boulevards. The road has two lanes in both directions and grandstands either side where crowds watch the party's tribute presentations and parades. Of course, the traffic regulations don't apply to us. Other drivers have to pull over and wait patiently until we speed past. A presidential convoy always has precedence. Munyam Ham sits next to me in the passenger seat. He asks several times how I'm feeling. The nearer we get to the stadium, the stronger that barely describable feeling in my belly becomes, a kind of tickling, taut feeling, butterflies. So, you're nervous, Latif? Munyam Hamd observes as we pull into the car park. This makes me more anxious. If he's noticed, will others? The real Uday certainly wouldn't be at all worried he'd probably be irritable and bored. Nothing's going to happen, Munyam Ham says reassuringly. I open the door when he reminds me, Uday, your cigars, and grins. I grin back at him, pick up the solid silver case full of Monte Cristo No. 6, tuck it inside my jacket pocket and get out the car. As my cluster of bodyguards are checking my passage to the stairs is safe, I straighten my jacket and tie and put on my Ray-Bans. There's hardly anyone in the car park and the game isn't due to start for a few minutes but my heart is racing. I can feel it pounding. I feel tension in every muscle in my body. My pulse must be over 130 but I try my best to look relaxed. Suddenly we all sprint to the stairs. My bodyguards hurriedly escort me to the presidential box. It's in sector A of the long side of the impressive stadium. It has comfy upholstered chairs, artificial grass on the floor, Iraqi flags and the obligatory huge portrait of Saddam. I take my seat in the front row and bodyguards sit either side of me. The 50,000 people already in the stadium greet my appearance with polite applause. No spontaneous, euphoric welcome. They clap because applause is a duty when a member of the presidential family enters the VIP box. 
I give the appropriate response. I ignore them. The match kicks off. I light my first Monte Cristo and smoke it the way I've been taught to. I remember every small detail. I inhale and move my hand like Uday Hussein does. I've even cut off the end of the cigar with a silver cigar cutter like he does. It's a waste of time as the plebes are far too far away to notice such minute details. But it all helps convince them that they're watching the match in the distinguished company of Uday Saddam Hussein, the son of their president. I'm concentrating so hard on imitating Uday that the game taking place in front of me is a bit of a blur. It doesn't matter. It provides little excitement and at halftime the score is 0 to 0. I'm aware that the Iraqi television station recording the match points its cameras over at the VIP box several times. But I'm not worried. Uday told me his media team have instructed the station not to film close-ups of me and I know the cameraman won't dare disobey. The second half was more eventful. The pilot's team wins 2-0. I'd be lying if I said I knew who scored them. As the final whistle blows, Munyam Hamd produces 11 little burgundy cases that I notice match my tie. Do your best, Latif. Think of God's help, he says encouragingly. I have to present medals to the winning team. I get to my feet and wave twice to the crowd. Surrounded by bodyguards, I stride out onto the pitch to congratulate the winners. My bodyguards are clustered so tightly around me that I can hardly see what's going on around me. The excitement of the crowd is quite off-putting as is the thought how furious Uday will be if I slip on the pitch or drop a medal. But I concentrate and manage to hand over a case to the first player, shake his hand, give him a curt nod and move on to the next. I don't say anything to them or smile. A bodyguard hands me the boxes, I take them, and hand them out, one by one. No player dares to ask a question and I'm careful not to look any of them in the eye. That's pointless too, as I have ray bands on so they can't see my eyes are larger than Uday's. It seems an eternity until I present the last medal. Very relieved, I briefly turn and wave to the spectators still left in the stadium. Then we hurry back to the cars and drive like maniacs back to project number 7. Munyam Hamd is full of praise. He says I was good, very good and his words relax me a little. I haven't a clue how convincing I really was. It's a bit like a first encounter with a woman. You smile at her and she smiles back but you can't be sure whether she's just being polite or whether it's more meaningful than that. Uncertainty and doubt. You have to overcome these feelings, I tell myself. It doesn't matter a damn whether the bodyguards think I'm good or not. What does matter is I've got to get into a supercilious, dictatorial mindset. I've got to be overflowing with self-confidence and arrogance at all times then I'll have got it right. Everything else is of secondary importance. What's important is I keep my Ray-Ban eyes focused on the final goal. And that final goal is I am Uday Saddam Hussein. Uday is waiting for me by the swimming pool. He has two brandy glasses in his hand. He flies over to me and kisses me on the mouth. I saw you on television, he gushes, you are absolutely outstanding. Simply perfect. No one noticed a thing. Everyone thought you were me. Everyone, including the players. Beaming, he hands me a brandy glass and leads me by the arm to chairs saying, have a drink. We'll go through the video recording tomorrow. The next morning I'm awoken at 8 a.m. I just have time for a black coffee when Munyam Hamd calls me into Uday's study. For the first time, we don't go to the video wall room but stay in the more relaxed surroundings to view the football match footage of me. I have to agree with them that everything looks absolutely authentic. Me smoking in the presidential box, me waving, me handing out the medals. Uday must repeat the word perfect at least 30 times. He's proud of me and I feel relieved, even liberated. My self-doubt and fear of failure is all wiped away and only one troubling thought remains in my mind. Latif Yahya no longer exists. Despite all the distractions, I can't help thinking about my parents. They haven't heard from me for over six months now. They haven't a clue where I am, what I'm doing, how I am. They don't even know if I'm still alive. They must be worried sick. 
wondering if I've been killed on the front line and hoping I'm unhurt and have been taken prisoner. I'd always written to them once a week or phoned them from headquarters if I had the chance. But now no letter, no call, nothing. They'll know something serious has happened to me. I wonder how my mother is and become quite frantic to know. I may be 23 and an Iraqi army officer but my parents have always been sacred to me. My mother is my goddess. She loves me and I love her. I think she has a right to know what her eldest son is doing and how he is. I decide to talk to Uday about it but have to choose my moment carefully. Not yet, it's too early. On the other hand, I've never seen him in a better mood than he's in now. He's positively euphoric about my performance in the stadium. I probably very wisely decide against making any requests for the time being. I want to enjoy my triumph not snatch defeat from it by annoying him again. Uday devotes his life to pleasure. He normally sleeps until 10.30 in the morning. His bodyguards stay up all night guarding him. They usually sit by the pool next to the bar, passing the time talking trivia and cleaning their guns. I gradually get to know them all. Their boss is Azam al Tikriti. Azam is only two years older than Uday and me. I remember him from school. Uday, he was a bad pupil, too. Once, after my football stadium appearance, I'm sitting next to him by the pool, drinking. After a few glasses, he confesses that he faked his documents at school. The teacher found out and reported Azam to the teacher's commission. Surprisingly, as his surname was Al Tikriti, they showed Azam no mercy and locked the 16 year old in prison for six months. He left school in disgrace without graduating. He was introduced into Uday's inner circle by Dabi al Masihi. Dabi was a real social animal. Whenever he showed up at the Al Alwiya club, he was always the center of attention. He had a suave, winning manner. He was charming, cultured, interesting, and witty young man with a handsome, flawless face. In fact, he had the purest, palest skin I've ever seen in a man. He was a close friend of Uday and also knew Azam. Through Dabi, the two met and Uday soon declared Azam to be his best friend. Just a few months later, Dabi vanished from the social scene. He was last seen talking to one of Uday's girlfriends at a party. Uday immediately had him banned from the Al Alwiya club and made a persona non grata in Baghdad society. As we lays by the pool, I ask Azam what Dabi is up to now. He lowers his head, avoids my eyes and just says, I saw him recently. He looks terrible. I don't know what they did to him. I quickly changed the subject. I later found out that Dabi was exiled to America by Saddam. Uday has another confidant among his bodyguards. Ahmad Soliman, a sinewy man of average height. He has a degree, is an accomplished karate instructor and can ooze incredible charm when talking to people, particularly girls. No one is less shy than Ahmad. He has no qualms about starting up a conversation with anyone. If Uday wants to meet a girl, he sends Ahmad to make the introductions. Ahmad isn't just Uday's bodyguard, he's his girl finder in chief, an important role in a constant parasitical presence. He uses and abuses his position mercilessly and is a brutal rapist and murderer but I'm not to discover that until later. The spy in the camp is Salam al Anusi. He's a walking, talking notepad. He spies on Uday's friends and reports back on what they've been up to. One careless word, one thoughtless remark and you're in Salam's notebook. And being in Salam's notebook is the same as a criminal indictment. Salam is slimier than a slug covered in suntan oil although you wouldn't immediately think so. The animal of Uday's pack is Maid Fadel. He has a university degree. What in, I'm not sure. But if there was one awarded for being completely unscrupulous and relishing carrying out violent rapes on Uday's orders, then might would pass with honors. The torture specialist is Sadun al Tikriti. He has a college qualification, too. I wonder who taught him to be so ruthless and cruel. Sadun is a cold fish who's willing to commit any crime to keep Uday happy. Namir al Tikriti has a novel responsibility. He organizes all Uday's parties which is almost a full-time occupation as there are so many. He's closely related to Uday, but, 
alas for me, doesn't look like him, and is undeniably an expert in the entertainment field, the lurid, sleazy kind as every party turns into an orgy that would embarrass a Roman emperor. Namir is Uday's master of ceremonies and caters for Uday's taste in decorations and music. Maksud al Tikriti is master of Uday's phone book. He makes all Uday's appointments and decides who gets Uday's top secret phone numbers and who doesn't. Muhammad al Duri is the chauffeur. He ferries around all Uday's girlfriends. He's considered a soul of discretion and also doubles up his usefulness to Uday by acting as a kind of porter. Dafir Jabber H. I. Mia and Namir al Ubaidi are the elite in Udi's gang, nothing is beneath them, rape, murder, theft, torture, Ude names it they do it and more off their own bat. They are also the cleaners of the gang, when a girl is used up one or all of them will get rid of her, in whatever way that happens to be. They do however have a favorite lake outside Baghdad where more than one unfortunate girl's body has been discovered. In reality, the list of Ude's friends is much longer than that. It reads like a who's who of Baghdadi criminal society. Uday's fascinated by seedy, murky characters. He's deeply attracted to the underworld which is well represented in Baghdad. The worse, the more extreme, the more perverse, the better. That seems to be Uday's motto. After just a few months in his obnoxious company, I'm certain Uday wouldn't be capable of living any kind of normal life even if he wasn't Saddam Hussein's eldest son and a prime target for political assassination. And that's a continual threat because Uday has a long list of enemies. A list that's about to become considerably longer. For I soon learn why I was recruited now of all times. The reason why they were so keen to find and train a fide for Uday as soon as possible. And definitely before the spring of 1988. The clan knew months in advance that in spring of that year a crime would take place of such monstrous inhuman cruelty that it had only been carried out once before in all human history and that was during the Second World War. Back then it was the gassing of the Jews. Saddam planned something horrifically similar involving mustard gas, against his own people. Follow for the next chapter.